On behalf of the Center for Strategic Philanthropy uh, at the University of Cambridge's uh, Judge Business School, thank you uh, very much for taking the time to speak with me, uh, and as always, a pleasure to see you. Uh, it would take the length of this whole interview and, and more if I was to run through Sir Ronald's uh, achievements and uh, accolades, so I'll just say that he absolutely deserves the title of uh, father of British venture capital and, and godfather of uh, impact uh, investment from finding Apex Partners in 1972 to your work as chairman of the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment, Bridges Ventures, Social Finance in the UK, USA and Israel, uh, and Big Society Capital, which uh, is the UK's first social investment bank. You really have uh, pioneered uh, over decades uh, so much of today's trend towards aligning business capital with societal and environmental needs. Sir Ronald, uh, I'd like to start by asking you about the current state of impact investment. You know, since I started studying this phenomenon close to 20 years ago uh, and practicing it wherever I can, uh, there's a clear trend uh, towards um, uh, this practice uh, and the adoption of the broader philosophy uh, around the role that financial investments can play in enhancing uh, social outcomes. However, many are still skeptical that there is no trade-off between profit and purpose. So is this trend unstoppable in your view? And how long will it take for it to become properly mainstream and perhaps even uh, the norm? Uh, well, but first of all, uh, please call me Ronnie. Uh, it's wonderful uh, to be uh, sharing a platform uh, together uh, again. Um, and I'm delighted that to uh, be sharing our views uh, with the Cambridge uh, uh, community. Uh, the answer to your question is I think we've reached the point of no return with regard to impact and it is inevitable now in my view, but I keep my fingers crossed as I say it, I will uh, explain uh, why I think it's inevitable that impact is now going to begin to play a major role at the center of our economies. And what started out as a journey on the path of impact investment for me uh, 20, 20 years ago led to the realization that if you optimize risk return impact as an investor, uh, then it really begins to put us all on the path of bringing risk return impact to the center of our economies. And why, why does uh, that happen? It happens because the trends which led investors to channel today more than $30 trillion of uh, capital to environmental, social and uh, governance investing, and which have led investors to channel what would be a trillion dollars this year to impact investment where you measure the impact created as well as the intention uh, to create it, which uh, also has, uh, will, that trillion is equivalent to the whole of the venture capital pool, Badra. Um, and, and together, more than 30 trillion represents more than a third of professionally managed assets in the whole world. So we're not talking here of a flash in the pan, but one important element is missing and the element is impact transparency. Now you and I know that uh, the conversations around measuring impact have been going on for decades uh, with uh, the environmental movement getting going first on measuring environmental impact and uh, the social uh, impact side coming into real focus maybe a decade uh, ago. And today, technology enables us to bring transparency to all the impacts of a company. What does that mean? Measuring its uh, employment impact, of course, measuring its operational impact, and measuring its product impact. All of these impacts uh, on both people and the environment. And a Harvard Business School project I've been in, in, involved with, which I'm proud to chair, uh, has published the uh, 
environmental damage created by 1,800 companies across the world. In monetary terms, you can now uh, look at uh, companies. Uh, there was a shareholder rebellion against Procter & Gamble uh, just a few days ago. Uh, you can look at uh, Procter & Gamble's numbers and see that it creates $1.7 billion worth of environmental damage uh, in a year, equivalent to more than 10% of its, of its pre-tax profit. So the, you go to that Harvard data, which now is beginning to include employment impact as well, the cost of diversity and so on. Soon we will have product impact too. Within the next few months, we will be able to look at the total impact of a company. And then I think it will be inevitable that governments will have to mandate this. No, I think it's very exciting, the work that you're doing on that front. And I totally agree with you that this is perhaps uh, the uh, last missing piece of this phenomenon, um, having some standards or act means. Uh, and so I hope that uh, by being able to define that better uh, and, to, and to standardize that, uh, we'll be able to convert uh, the non-believers uh, very, very soon. Um, I, so uh, how do you expect uh, COVID-19 will affect both the appetite and perhaps the urgency uh, behind the use of financial investments and instruments towards social and environmental goals alongside generating financial uh, returns, of course? And what role does impact investment play in uh, building back better? Okay, well, excellent question, but we can see COVID accelerating uh, the advance of, um, of, of impact. Uh, why? Uh, first of all, it's shaking all our habits and, uh, and beliefs. Uh, it's also leading to huge questioning of both capitalism and, and democracy across uh, the world. And governments are going to emerge from the COVID crisis, as you well know, with huge national debt and they're going to face a huge social issues because we're going to see high levels of unemployment for a chunk of time, uh, unfortunately. A lot of uh, the big businesses that have uh, furloughed uh, workers uh, will not take them back because they've got used to working uh, on a slimmed down uh, basis. We're going to have to retrain. Um, uh, the unemployed to get into jobs. We're going to have issues of poverty, of homelessness, and, uh, and so on. So for governments, the only way that they can cope with the surge of, uh, of uh, social issues and with the huge environmental problems we've, we've been facing is to bring business and investors alongside to help bring solutions instead of the self-defeating system we are living with now, where companies in their pursuit of profit create huge damage environmentally and socially, and governments try to tax us all in order to try to remedy them. And impact investment and the tools of impact investment, like uh, social and development impact bonds, uh, outcomes funds, um, uh, social investment uh, uh, banks, uh, social bonds, uh, and so on, uh, those tools are going to be very important in bringing investor capital to help tackle these issues. Now, the reason I think governments are going to have to follow the path of uh, our predecessors after the crash of 1929, uh, when uh, in 1933, the US government uh, mandated transparency on the profit of companies with generally accepted accounting principles and auditors, which hadn't existed until then. Uh, the reason governments, I think, are going to have to do the same thing for impact transparency now is that as the information from Harvard and other places begins to prove that it's price sensitive information today, that you can see a correlation in the Harvard data between companies uh, in the same sector uh, that pollute very heavily 
and that pollute less. You can see a correlation between the level of pollution and the market ratings of companies, their price earnings ratios, their value on the, the stock market. Regulators are going to become aware that uh, in order to maintain the orderly market, they have to shift us to generally accepted impact principles. And so we have technology and transparency on impact uh, beginning to create an inevitable uh, path now uh, to uh, risk return impact optimization. And what we are going to discover, and I, I speak as somebody who spent his whole life in the investment business, as you know, Bhadra, we're going to discover that optimizing risk return impact delivers better returns than optimizing just risk and return. So turning to uh, the emerging markets, uh, as you know, the top 30 uh, fastest growing economies in the world last year were all in emerging markets. Uh, a lot of wealth is being generated uh, and transitioned uh, within these regions of the world to new generations of uh, socially minded entrepreneurs and investors uh, across uh, Africa, the Middle East, uh, and developing Asia. In some ways, we have a cleaner canvas when building practices in, in these regions uh, of the world. So how do we best capture this opportunity in a way that ensures solutions are designed for local needs and suited to local cultures also? So the great thing about impact investment is that uh, you can address uh, the key issues in, in different countries in different ways. Uh, let me take the issue of education in emerging countries. Uh, we have an effort now uh, to bring a billion dollars uh, to improve education in the Middle East and Africa. Potentially to improve the education of 10 million children. Now, in a traditional way, you would say, let's uh, give it in grants, uh, either through aid or philanthropy, or help governments uh, uh, fund programs by making grants to them. But when you begin to think impact investment, you say, let us get aid organizations and philanthropists and local governments to put a billion dollars together into an outcomes fund, professionally managed, that will sign contracts with delivery organizations, state actors working on the public education system. And once these contracts are signed, those delivery organizations will be able to raise investment capital, like tech entrepreneurs raise venture capital from development impact bond funds, which are now being set up by UBS, Bridges Ventures, and, and others. And let us create a new type of ecosystem where this private investment money funds charitable organizations and businesses to achieve social goals. And the outcomes payers, the combination of aid organizations, governments, and, 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 and philanthropists, pay only on results. So the investor's taking the delivery risk, and the investor expects to make a very attractive, uncorrelated return of 5 to, to 10% for taking that delivery risk. So I think the ability now to use impact investment in, in emerging uh, countries can accelerate improvement in a lot of uh, the uh, constraints uh, on economic growth uh, that, currently, uh, that currently exist. And so if you combine the use of these instruments together with the transparency that uh, investors are going to have on uh, the performance of, of companies, not just in profit terms, but in terms of impact, it should drive massive amounts of capital to emerging countries. So as you know, the, the Center for Strategic Philanthropy is focused on the practice of strategic uh, impact-oriented philanthropy in the world's fastest growing markets. 
How does the field of strategic philanthropy intersect with social investment, uh, if at all? How can lessons and insights from one help to enhance the other? And, and are you excited about the often, often touted concept of blended capital or blended finance, uh, combining totally. business capital, philanthropic capital, and even uh, government capital to help enhance social returns? Totally. Let, let, me, let me give you an, an example. Uh, uh, that uh, will speak eloquently um, to your question. Um, technology uh, is enabling us to tackle a host of social issues in ways we could not have tackled uh, before its arrival. Artificial intelligence is, is now hugely enhancing our ability to tackle many social issues. So there are some entrepreneurs in Israel, uh, from where I'm actually uh, speaking uh, today, um, that uh, is one of the most successful entrepreneurs in, in, in the world uh, with uh, his co-founders. He sold Mobileye to Intel uh, for uh, $15 billion startup, uh, to $15 billion. A few uh, years ago, uh, he created a company to help the blind and it's called Orcam, and it involves creating a pair of spectacles with a little bit of a, of a, a memory light device on the side that whispers into the ear of uh, the wearer uh, the page of the book uh, they're reading or the banknote in their hand, uh, uh, so. Um, unbelievably well read, and huge value for the 35 million blind people in the world and the 250 million visually impaired people. Now, if you think about technology from the perspective of impact, you ask yourself the question, how can this technology help the largest number of people in the world? And you get a very surprising answer, Bhadra. You get the answer, what if you gave these spectacles to the 800 million illiterate adults in the world. What would that do for their lives and livelihoods, for their economies and, 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 and for the world economy to bring 800 million people to reading who are currently uh, illiterate? And you now have a $1.1 billion uh, market. Now, imagine that you want to get these spectacles to the illiterate. What's the business model going to be for illiterate people who are by definition at the bottom of, of the pile uh, in their ability to pay? You need philanthropy to kick it off. So you might want to raise a couple of hundred million dollars of philanthropy to be able to distribute uh, these spectacles initially uh, to illiterate people working within companies where they might get some form of advancement uh, for, uh, you know, for their ability to, to read. You can then begin to imagine a business model, and this is where the blending comes in, where companies in the future will actually pay uh, for their employees to have these spectacles. Uh, and perhaps receive uh, uh, the payment back over a period of time from the employee. We're talking, uh, if we're talking large numbers, we're talking of relatively low uh, a price for these uh, spectacles. And then if you want to expand it to the 800 million people we're talking about, perhaps financial organizations will come in um, to fund uh, you know, through philanthropy and, and investment uh, money, uh, the purchase of these spectacles. So the blending of impact investment and philanthropy is a major, a major tool uh, in, in tackling the big social uh, and environmental challenges we face. It's a very powerful example of how can you unite towards uh, an impact. Um, so you mentioned uh, government. Uh, 
What role, if any, do governments have uh, beyond regulation in fostering impact investment and strategic philanthropy? What else could they be doing to encourage more of these practices? So they, they can be doing a lot. Uh, one, uh, they have to tweak the duties of uh, uh, company directors and trustees of pension funds and charitable endowments so that they are not just able uh, to take into account uh, social and environmental considerations when making uh, decisions about, uh, about investment, uh, but they must take into account these, um, you know, these considerations. Uh, so that is a, a very important uh, dimension now in empowering company directors and trustees to optimize risk return impact. It's a necessary uh, change. The second thing governments can do is to begin to measure the cost of social issues to them as the UK did in six years ago in 2014 and make this information publicly available uh, so that we can begin to see outcomes payers come into play, often alongside uh, government, attracting uh, impact bond investment at scale uh, to tackle issues of retraining the unemployed, um, uh, training uh, unemployed youth through apprentices and, and, you know, and so on and so forth, reducing dropout rates from education, preventing uh, pre-diabetics from becoming diabetic, taking the homeless into homes and jobs, uh, and so on, and, um, uh, and so forth. And governments can provide, in addition to uh, the outcomes funding, governments can provide incentives uh, for investors to get involved. We also want to democratize this form of investment. We would like the average person to be able to invest in a, a social impact bond fund that addresses an issue that they're particularly passionate about. Um, the UK government introduced incentives uh, uh, a few years ago. Uh, they had all sorts of constraints around them, which now must be want other countries um, to do the same. To create the environment uh, that to allow uh, impact uh, investment to get to to get to scale. And finally, government can shift its own expenditure uh, from uh, the basis of uh, purchasing services to the basis of looking at the outcomes to be achieved and measuring the outcomes that are achieved. If we can, I mention all of this in my book, Impact, Reshaping Capitalism to Drive Real Change, there's a whole chapter on government. If we can get government to understand that they need this uh, and that they should create this enabling environment because it really is the next frontier for society and, and capitalism, then we will progress a lot uh, faster uh, to improve our society and our planet. So despite uh, some beliefs that uh, all governments need, need to do is get out the way, uh, I certainly agree with you that there's a lot governments can do to help enhance uh, this general field and practice uh, and be a, a really um, credible and authentic partner uh, in, in, uh, in, in generating the much needed impacts, so, you know, social as well as environmental around the world, particularly as we emerge from, uh, from this current uh, uh, pandemic. Um, Dear uh, Ronnie, uh, as always, uh, inspirational and uh, enlightening to hear from you, my friend. Uh, I look forward to the pleasure of connecting with you in person again in the uh, hopefully not too distant future, inshallah, and uh, wish you uh, more and more positive uh, impact in the months and years ahead. Thank you. And to you too, Badr, and thank you for all the good that uh, you're doing. Thank you very much. <laughs>